Thanks for joining us. Today, I want to bring a message called Access Granted. Have you ever done a computer program or something? Maybe you're going to check your email, and you have to type in a password. And you type in the password, and you get one little character wrong. It says, Access Denied. Access Denied. Access Denied. How many have seen that? Well, this is God's message to the world by way of the cross of Jesus. The tomb is opened. Access granted. Access is not denied, it's granted. And this is the story of access granted. So join with me today as we look at Matthew chapter 28, verses 1 to 15. Before we look at that, let's ask the Lord to bless our time. Our Father God, we thank you for this glorious day. It truly is a happy day. And Lord, we know that it's not just happiness, but it's joy. It's joy, it's unspeakable joy that, that we are gathering together and celebrating the resurrection of our Lord. Lord Jesus, you are who you said you are. And we thank you and praise you for your resurrection because through your death on the cross and your resurrection, you have taken the sting of death out. The victory of death is, is gone. You have been victorious over death. And we thank you for that victory. Now we ask, Holy Spirit, that you lead, guide, and direct us in your word. And may it be alive within our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Matthew chapter 28, beginning with verse 1, after the Sabbath at dawn, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him, they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here. He is risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, He has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. They will see me. While the women were on their way, some of the guards went into the city and reported to the chief priests everything that had happened. When the chief priests had met with the elders and devised a plan, they gave the soldiers a large sum of money, telling them, You are to say his disciples came during the night and stole him away while we were asleep, asleep. If this report gets to the governor, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So the soldiers took the money and did as they were instructed. And this story has widely been circulated among the Jews to this very day. Well, friends, today I would like to, for us to ponder four things surrounding the resurrection of Jesus. These are four things that shatter what that money was supposed to do. You know, friends, money doesn't, money can't buy happiness. Money can't keep the truth of who Jesus is quiet. Jesus is who he said he is. And today I want to share with you four reasons why we see the resurrection as we see it, as it really happened, and why God did it. And so let's look. Our first part is this. In verse 1, it says, After the Sabbath at dawn, the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. You see, the resurrection is about this, about Jesus rising from the grave, but also targeting ordinary people who witness an extraordinary event. We have this, that there's so much ordinariness in this extraordinary thing that happened that the people of the resurrection, you look at the people, they were ordinary, everyday people. They weren't people who were of high esteem or in high levels of government. They were people of ordinary existence. And we have here fishermen. We have a former tax collector. Just ordinary, everyday people. We have the Mary Magdalene and uh, the other Mary, Martha, and all these women. We're going to talk about this in a little greater detail here. But think about the ordinariness of these people. Friends, I want to tell you something. The gospel is for ordinary people. 
The gospel is meant for the entire world because the world is filled with ordinary people. When it, what is it that changes us from ordinary to extraordinary? It's the grace of God. It's the grace of God. That when we accept Christ as Lord and Savior, our sins are no longer recognized. And we have God's extraordinary work in our lives. Some people think, well, you know what? I don't need God because I am ordinary. I'm, I'm extraordinary in that I can make a lot of money or I can do this and I can work this way and I'm extraordinary and I'm, I'm better than you. Friends, God doesn't work that way. The message of the gospel is for the ordinary and also for those who think they're extraordinary, but they're not. Because the Bible says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Amen? All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Throughout the ministry, Jesus surrounded himself with ordinary people. Luke's gospel records the following and Luke's gospel reveals that Jesus extends an invitation to everybody. In Luke 8, it says, 8 verse 1, Sometime afterward, he went through all the, t uh, all the towns and villages, preaching and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. The twelve were with him, and also some women who had been healed of evil spirits and disabilities. Mary, called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had come out. And Joanna, the wife of Cusa, Herod's household manager and Susanna and many others who provided for them out of their own resources. Do you see this eclectic group of people? We have the mention here of Joanna, uh, who was the wife of Cusa, Herod's household manager, who heard about Jesus and followed him. You see, friends, Jesus touched lives, and the influence of Jesus was felt all across this area. And by the way, it's almost like, have you ever taken a rock on a still day when the a lake or a, uh, a little pond is real still, it looks like glass? And have you ever taken a rock and thrown it in and interrupted that serene look by the, all these waves that come out? That's what it was like when Jesus came. That Jesus' impact into this world created this, this rush of of, of change lives that started and just kept going. And by the way, it's continuing to go forth. Amen? The generations hear about Jesus. The generations hear and they receive. And friends, I believe this, that there's power in the ordinary. Don't ever take the ordinary for granted. It's the, the power in the ordinary, the power of the ordinary Savior who came. By the way, did you know that at the time when Jesus was here, there were many claiming to be Messiah. Many of them claimed to be Messiah. But the carpenter's son, by the way, Joseph was his stepdad. The father is Jesus' father. And Mary, she bore Jesus, just like it said at the beginning of Matthew, she became obedient and did what God had planned for. And these are ordinary people. And there's power in the ordinary. Did you know there's power in your ordinary story? My ordinary story? I don't have a, a, a testimony that will shock you. I don't have a testimony that will say, well, I was, I was on, on dope or this or that. And friends, I want to say this. I thank God that that I didn't have to go that way to get to Jesus, and I'm not putting anyone down if that's the life you come out of. What I'm saying is this, that at the age of 13 years old, I gave my heart to Jesus, and I had a conversion experience. And friends, I will say this, that that's my ordinary testimony. And at the age of 13, God saved me, and I proclaimed Jesus as Lord. And friends, I tell you what, when all is said and done, wherever we come from, if you have a testimony that would put people on the edge of your seat, you know, friends, there are testimonies here that we would go, whoa, that's incredible. You know what I'm saying? Some of you right now, you can think of your testimony that if you didn't know Jesus, would you even be alive right now? Would you even be here if God had not rescued you? And you and I, we all hear each other's testimonies. And the bottom line is this, that we all have 
made the angels in glory shout hallelujah when we got saved. Ordinary story or not, we've all caused heaven to rejoice over salvation. The Bible says that even angels stoop to look into these things. Even angels look, they stoop down to look at the saints to understand what's it like for Jesus to die for you on the cross? What's it like to receive forgiveness of your sin? We don't know, tell us. You see, the angels are showing up more a little bit about angels here in a little bit. By the way, I'm glad you're choosing to spend your afternoon with us today. I'm just kidding. All right. <laughs> it's not going to be a long message. I'm just saying that we have so much exciting things to talk about, but it begins with the ordinary. There's something about God that is so powerful. People are always going, God, send me a sign. Send me a sign this way or that. Lord, send me a strike of lightning that will show that you hear me. God doesn't work that way. God speaks in the ordinary, everyday things because Jesus came in an ordinary wrapping of human flesh, and he hung around ordinary people. We have here Mary Magdalene, who's mentioned in all four Gospels as the first woman to come to the tomb, and she discovered this resurrection. Matthew mentions the other Mary, and Mark refers to Mary, the mother of Joseph, and uh, Mary, the mother of James and Salome. Luke includes Joanna and other women who came and followed with. They were all considered disciples of Jesus, ordinary people. These were all witnesses to the crucifixion. Matthew 27, 55 to 56 says, Many women were there watching from a distance. They had followed Jesus from Galilee to care for his needs. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of Zebedee's sons. They all stood there and watched Jesus die on the cross from a distance. Well, Jesus went to where ordinary people were. Matthew 9, verse 35, says that he went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the good news. They were ordinary people who became very distraught because of the crucifixion. They were distraught. They were like, oh, we, we saw him. We, we, did, we um, saw what he did, the miracles. He raised Lazarus. He, he raised the widow of Nain's son. He raised the daughter of Jairus, and he healed so many people. He gave, he gave uh, sight to Bartimaeus. We saw these things, and now it's over with. Friend, Good Friday was there, but Sunday's coming. They were talking about this. They were distraught. They were sad. It's, uh, Mary Magdalene is truly the portrait of a grieving person. Mary stood outside the tomb crying as she, as she wept. She came to the tomb. John reports this. And it says that she was weeping. Do you know what the word weeping means in Greek here? That she was wailing. She was sobbing so loud and crying on that resurrection morning. She didn't have the news yet of Jesus being raised from dead. She's going to the tomb and she's wailing over the death of Jesus. The Greek word is klaiaho, klaio. This means to sob, to wail aloud, rather than silently. It means to let loose. They were ordinary people who became disillusioned, but they went to the tomb. And there at the tomb, everything was changed because an angel came down from heaven. Isn't this a God thing? That an angel comes down from heaven, takes this stone that probably weighed a couple tons and with his hand like it's paper rolls it aside in fact I believe that that rock that that stone tipped over because it says the angel sat on it <laughs> what man took to keep people out God took and made it an angel's seat And he sat there, and he said, who are you looking for? Jesus. He is not here. He is risen. Go and tell his disciples. And then he said, now I have told you. 
You know what that is? You know what that reminds me of when the angel said, now I have told you. That means mission accomplished. I gave you the message I was sent to give you. You see, God took an angel and said, I want you to go and I want you to tell these, these ladies that Jesus is not here. He's risen. And you tell them to go on ahead because Jesus is going to meet them. <laughs> they had that in the memo. The memos of heaven. The announcement to go. And by the way, this angel was shocking to look at. Very shocking. In fact, how do we know that? Because the guards stood there. They thought they were just guarding a corpse. They, they probably had done duties, uh, other duties, and nothing had been so boring as this one. And they had been on, on duty guarding the tomb. And they were probably very bored. Well, they probably were nodding off. And all of a sudden, their nodding off was interrupted by this incredible sight of an angel coming, <laughs> rolling away the stone and sitting on it. The Bible says that these men became like dead men. You know what that means? They passed out. They fainted. They couldn't handle it. They became like dead men. They dropped to the ground. Well, what's our expectation when we go to church? Do we go to church as if we're visiting a tomb? Or do we go to church as if we're visiting the throne of the living God? You see, when we come to church, we're coming to worship the living one, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. A second thing to ponder this morning is this one. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is the full display of the supernatural power of God. There was a violent earthquake for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning. You know why his appearance was like lightning? Because he had just stepped out of the very presence of the throne room of God. The glory of the Lord will touch everything that comes into contact with it. If Moses could come down from the mountain with his face glowing, the people had to put a, 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 a towel over his face. Moses, your face is bright. He had been in the presence of the living God. Amen. This angel's appearance was like lightning. How bright is lightning? How bright is it? You know, lightning and thunder has been misunderstood until recent times. The lightning produces thunder. And when lightning lights up the sky, the electricity in the sky, it, whoosh, it superheats the air, which causes the massive booms called thunder. Friends, can you imagine <laughs> this, this angel coming down, lit up the way he is because of the glory of God. His clothes were white as snow. Friends, when you and I get into heaven, guess what's going to be missing? The sunshine. There's no sun in heaven. There's only one sun in heaven, and he's the son of the living God, and his name is Jesus. Amen. The Bible says there's no need for moon or sun because the light that comes is from the throne room of God. All of heaven is lit up because God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. <laughs> so when Jesus is sent, when Jesus arose from the grave, this angel comes down, all lit up with the glory of God because he had been in his presence. It's like the glory. The glory is something that is on one. Do you know, do you know that the glory actually means, the, the Hebrew word means a heaviness. It's something that can be felt. It comes over one. And heaviness not in the fact that it's oppressive, but a heaviness in the fact that it is something that can be felt. The glory of the Lord. The Bible says that the glory of the Lord is our strength. The glory of the Lord is what came and demonstrated to these, these human, ordinary human people. That's what human means. But anyway, these ordinary people, 
that something extraordinary happened. It's the supernatural power of God. You and I serve a supernatural God. How often do we remember that? I don't know about you, but I'm at the point in my life that my God can do whatever he wants to. Because he is all powerful. Don't doubt. If you have a need, pray this supernatural God who displayed the supernatural wonders that we see recorded right here. He hears you. Amen? Well, here we have the collision of the supernatural and the natural. Let me quick give you a summary of this, this collision that happened. It's like these two worlds collided. You have the natural world and you have the supernatural, and they collided, and here's what happened. When Jesus was dying on the cross, there was a, a miraculous darkness that covered the land. We see that in Luke chapter 23, verses 44 to 45. We hear about the rending of the, temp, of the veil in the temple. That, te that veil was about this thick, this thick, a, a, a hand's width thick. And it, it's like when Jesus died on the cross, it's like the Father reached down into the temple and took that big garment and ripped it in two. You know what that symbolized? Access opened. God didn't say access denied. He said access opened. And he tore the curtain in two. Why? The curtain was to keep one out. But you know what? Jesus died on the cross and paid the penalty. Come on in. Access opened. And then we have the miraculous earthquake when Jesus died, Matthew 27, 51. We have the miraculous opening of the tombs. Did you know that that's when, the, the, when that earthquake happened when Jesus died? Matthew 27, it says that the, the, the graves were exposed. The tombs were opened. And then we have the undisturbed grave clothes of Jesus in John chapter 21, verses 6 to 8. John and Peter ran to the tomb. Peter's the older of the two. And so he couldn't run as fast as John. John was running, and he beat Peter to the tomb. And he stopped because he saw that the tomb had been opened. He stopped at the door. He wouldn't go in. And then Peter comes, <gasps> you know, panting. And he gets to the tomb. And you know what? He goes right by the young whippersnapper, John. And he goes in, and then John comes in. And they look, and they see the grave clothes. They were there, and it looked as one had passed through. The napkin folded neatly beside. In other words, that would never be used again. Those grave clothes would never be used again on Jesus because he's alive. You know, Lazarus came out just a few weeks ago. He came out of the grave with his grave clothes still on, and he would have to use them again because he would die again. Jesus, not so. Jesus is alive. He's called the first fruit of the dead, the firstborn of the dead. You see, he has this supernatural body that can go right through walls. Oh, pastor, that sounds like it's uh, science fiction to me. Well, we see that a week later, Thomas is there. Thomas doubted. Thomas is a lot like us today sometimes. And he, didn't, he, couldn't believe, he couldn't grasp it. He must have been struggling with the death of Jesus still. And he said, unless I see the nail wounds in his hands, I won't believe. Well, Jesus showed up. The doors were locked for fear of the Jews, and all of a sudden they turn around, and there's Jesus. And you know, he has this physical body. They touched him. And he said, Thomas, come over here. Come, put your hand in my side. Come touch my wounds. It is I. And Thomas goes, my Lord and my God, it is you. He proclaimed Jesus, didn't he? Friends, there's a lot of supernatural surrounding Jesus. Do you know that there are two earthquakes mentioned? I gave you the first one, is that when Jesus died on the cross, there was an earthquake that happened. The second one is when Jesus arose from the dead. The earth responded to the resurrection of Jesus. 
You have the collision of the supernatural with the natural, but this very earth responded to her king, responded to her creator. You see, the Bible says that all things were created by him and for him, that he is, everything is under him, and the earth itself shook. <laughs> it shook, and Jesus is alive. Amen. Well, violent earthquake. The next thing we see here is the collaboration of angels. Angels are very busy concerning Jesus. You see, when God sent Jesus when to, as a little baby, a little tiny baby, he was announced by angels. The angelic activities surrounding uh, the, 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 the com first coming of Christ Luke chapter 2, remember? A few months ago we looked at this passage and there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby keeping watch over their flocks at night. They were watching over the Passover lambs that would die that next Passover. See, the Lamb of God was sent and the angels announced it. Here it says, an angel of the Lord appeared to them and said, and it says, the glory of the Lord shone around them. Once again, the glory of the Lord shone on them. There's bright light. And they said, they, these guys are terrified, right? And the angel says, don't be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people, all the people. Today in the town of, of David, a Savior has been born to you. He will be Christ the Lord. He is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Okay, so there was a collaboration of angels that they went and announced the birth of Jesus. Here they announced the resurrection of Jesus. The angel of the Lord came down from heaven, going to the tomb. He rolled back the stone and sat on it. I can just see this in my head where this angel comes down, lands on, on the ground, walks over, <clears throat> and then sits down. Probably... Go tell his disciples that he's not here. He's relaxed. How can this angel relax? How can this, this magnificent created being be so calm? Because hmm. he knows. Sunday morning's here. Resurrection day is here. And the Bible says that the women were terrified. The Bible says two things about these ladies. They're both filled with joy, but filled with fear at the same time. Have you ever experienced that? Where you've been scared, but joyful at the same time? There are two emotions that are colliding in, and you get this one mix of, oh, wow, the adrenaline pump, along with the fear, along with the joy that goes in between. They felt all of it. You see, the angel proclaimed the resurrection. Do we close the books on that? There's going to be one more. There's going to be one more declaration. There's going to be one more collaboration of angels. You know what it is? The return of Jesus. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command and with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet call of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are still together will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. <laughs> there will be a day where Jesus is going to return. And I believe that we're closer to that. You and I, if it happens in our lifetime, we will witness this. And it's going to be an ordinary day. We'll probably get up and have our coffee. We'll probably look at the news. And then we'll read our scriptures and pray to start the day. And we'll have our breakfast, brush our teeth, get ready for work, go to work. And, you know, something will happen at work. Oh, get over it. Whatever. Might be having a bad day. How many would like to see Jesus come on a Monday morning? He could come back any moment. He could come back any second. And the way that this world is going right now, 
I believe that we are closer to that glorious day than we even know. And friends, it's not something to be afraid of. It is something to be excited for. It is something to be in, it, just so excited about that we're telling everybody that we can, that Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. Get right with God. Because you know not the time when Jesus returns. And friends, I'm just so excited about that. So we have, we have these collaborations of angels who came the first time to tell the world, a bunch of shepherds, that Jesus was born. Then we have the resur- his death and then his resurrection. The angel came and said, go and tell his disciples. And then we have this return of our great God and Savior who's coming back. It's called the rapture. Amen. Well, we also have the collapse of guards because of the... And you're going, well, wait a minute here, Pastor Pete. Well, how come you're going from this glorious statement of of how Jesus was announced by this angelic host, the collaboration. Now you're going to the collapse of guards. If you notice, we gave you some C's here. The first C is the collision of the supernatural and the natural. The second one was the collaboration of the angelic. The third one is the collapse of the guards. And this all has to do with how one responded to the supernatural activity of God. We have here that these soldiers, these guards, okay, let's read it again. It says uh, that the words here are, they became terrified. They were, let's give you a a Greek, um, how do we define, they were totally freaked out. They were freaked and they dropped like dead men. They fainted. They experienced the presence of, of the Lord in the glory of the Lord in that angel, and they couldn't handle it, and they fell over. Friends, here's a difference between the redeemed and the unredeemed, that someday the redeemed of the Lord, for every single person who has accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, we will stand in the presence of the living God and we will give him honor and glory. And it says in the Bible, Ephesians chapter 2, talks about this, that every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father in heaven. But there will be those who have rejected Jesus. They will be summoned to the throne. They will be summoned. Everyone who has not accepted what Jesus did on the cross, everyone who has rejected Jesus will have to come and give account for their life. You see, everyone has the opportunity to hear the gospel message. And by the way, we are coming now to the days where there's no excuse. Even creation points to the Creator. And friends, there will be a day where there will be an accountability day. What did you do with the gospel message? I don't know about you, but I sure am glad that I can say I received Jesus. Oh, thank God I I received Jesus as my Lord. Thank you, Father, I received Jesus. My sins are washed away. (laughs) But those who have rejected, there will be taken and cast into the lake of fire, the second death, as if death isn't bad enough for somebody who doesn't know Jesus. It's called the second death. Did you know that if you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you've already died? I've already died. What? Yeah, you've already died. This is when it's our time to go home, we go home it'll be like walking into another room. It'll be like closing your eyes and all of a sudden you're in another place. Only there will be no more pain, sorrow, no more obstacles. There'll be nothing but joy, celebration. We're going to see Jesus for who he is. That's if we go home that way. But if we go home by way of rapture, you're going to be doing your day. All of a sudden, you'll be sipping a cup of coffee if you're on your coffee break, and all of a sudden, poof. Whoa, where's my coffee? I believe, first of all, you're going to hear a trumpet sound. 
There will be this trumpet sound. It's a signal. Church, get ready. Here comes Jesus. And we will see him face to face. Friends, the third thing is this. The imperatives of the resurrection. What are imperatives? They're commands. There are four of them. Four of them right here in our scripture. The first one is this. The angel said to the women, do not be afraid. Fear not. That's comfort. The first imperative is an imperative of comfort. Don't be afraid. Do you remember your dad or your mom telling you that? Don't be afraid. I'm here. When my son was little, he was just a little guy when we came. He was about a year old and a and year and a half. And uh, two, three, you know, I remember those years so, so awesome. And when I see a dad with, with little kids, I always, if, if I feel compelled, I will say, enjoy these years because they go fast. You know what I'm saying? And they kind of look at me funny, but then they see the gray hair. And it's like, oh, okay, how many kids do you have? I said, I have two. And, you know, we'll get talking about how, what a blessing kids are. But I remember my son one day. It was a Sunday night. Do you remember Sunday nights when you'd have worship services? and come? Those are wonderful evenings. And one night, we had a great service. Service was over with, and everybody was taken off. And my son and I, just a little guy, he's about three years old. He liked to go with me throughout the building as we shut the lights off. And so we shut the lights off downstairs, and down there, there's, it's over on one side where you shut the lights off. And so we came in on this stairwell down and in, and I felt his little hand. And I said, well, we called him Petey. Petey, should we shut the lights off? Yep. Okay. So we shut the lights off, and I said, oh, are you scared? You know what he said? No, Daddy. You're here. No, Daddy, you're here. I held on to that. And I held that hand all the tighter. Yeah, I'm here with you. Fear not. Fear not in your life because the Father's with you. When you have Jesus as Lord and Savior, you are not alone. You can go through awful things on this earth. And by the way, God never promised everything to be perfect. Don't you wish he did? But he didn't. You know what? That's kind of good in a lot of ways because you know what it does? It helps us to be more dependent upon his presence and to hold his hand all the tighter when the going gets tough because God has promised, never will I leave you or forsake you. Though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will be with you. Though you walk through some very dark times, you hold the Father's hand because you have been purchased by the blood of Jesus to become a son or daughter of the living God. So we have the comfort. The second imperative is he is not here. He is risen. That's truth. Truth. Jesus said that he is the way, the truth, and the life. And by the way, we're not talking about a little t. We're not talking about a truth. We're talking about the truth. This has the definite article on it, the truth, which means it is the truth. Jesus is all truth. And people will argue and say, well, there are many truths. There are many ways into heaven. No, there's one way, and his name is Jesus. He's the only way that we get into heaven. Heaven. And so he is not here. He is risen, just as he said. Romans chapter 1, verse 4 says, And through the spirit of holiness was declared with the power to be the Son of God by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. In other words, this is what it's saying. The Holy Spirit, the spirit of holiness, raised Jesus from the dead and therefore declared that he is who he said he is, the Son of God. The resurrection proves that Jesus is who he is. Amen? So we have comfort, truth. The third one is come and see. 
You know what that is? Invitation. Invitation. Come and see the place where he lay. It's invitation. Come and see. The fourth and final one is go quickly. That's instruction. Go quickly and tell his disciples. Go quickly and tell everyone that you know. Go quickly. Why are we to go quickly? We are not to drag our feet when it comes to the gospel message. We need to be right in the path of going quickly everywhere we go to tell somebody about Jesus. Why? Because he's the soon and coming one. I love the fact that there's an urgency put on this word, on this invitation to go quickly. Don't, don't hold that message to yourself. Release it. Release it. Amen? The fourth and final thing surrounding the resurrection that I'd like for us to ponder is the final one, and it's this one, the restoration of praise and joy. The restoration of praise and joy. Verse 8 says, So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. I wanted to stop there for a second. Notice this. It says they came to him and clasped his feet. So how did they do that? That means that when they saw Jesus, they hit the ground. They fell on the ground. They clasped his feet. They saw him and they worshipped him. The Bible says that immediately, basically, this is my uh, little transa translation, that when they saw Jesus, they hit the ground and they clasped his feet and they worshipped him. Notice that they were afraid yet filled with joy. Yes, we talked about that. I think it's worth considering. They, in their fear, they're walking away. Their hearts are pounding. The adrenaline was going on in their bodies. They could probably feel their hearts in their throat. Have you ever been so scared that your heart pounded and you could feel it in your throat? I believe that's the type of fear that they had. But yet they, had, they were filled with joy. He's alive. And so they're walking away. All of a sudden, Jesus intercepts them. There he is. It says, suddenly, Jesus met them. I love the way Jesus greets them. You know, this, this is something. I want us to pay attention to this for a second. Jesus, who just died on the cross, was buried. For three days, he was dead. And here, he's alive. And he comes out, and he goes like this. Greetings. He's smiling. The Greek word here is kahiro. And it means full of cheer. It means full of this joy. Isn't that amazing? The Savior is smiling. The resurrected one is smiling. You know that voice on the old, uh, the old Ten Commandments movie? Moses, Moses, do not come any closer. Take off your sandals. You know, it sounds like this <gasps> foreboding voice. It sounds like, whoa. I mean, it's a, it's, it's, it's a classic movie. And you say, well, what does that have to do with what you just read? Because I think in our minds we get this, this, this picture of Jesus as this somber Savior who doesn't smile, who takes everything so seriously. That's not what he's like at all in Scripture. You know what he's like? He is so welcoming that the children want to come to him. He is so filled with joy that there's joy that follows that dinner that Matthew had in his house? They had tax collectors and sinners there? I believe that the place was just laughing that night. Why? Because Jesus is in the house. And now we have the resurrected Savior who comes, and he didn't stand in front of them like this or like this. He stood, hey, it's me. It is me. 
And I believe that that's what made these women fall on their faces and worship him. Because his presence and his joy is so welcoming. The presence and joy of, of his presence with a smile on his face that welcomes one. And these women respond, afraid yet filled with joy, and it says they clasp his feet. They don't let go. And I believe that even though we don't have a video of recording of this, but it's their scripture, I think the Savior was smiling greatly. Because how do you feel when you have the victory? How do you feel when the mission is accomplished? How do you feel when you've just opened heaven up for the ordinary, everyday people who need you and you accomplished? You accomplished. You had victory over the enemy. How would you feel joyful? And that's what Jesus does. He expresses this joy. His greeting is one of, of joy. They clasp his feet and they worship him as he was, as he is, and as he will be. So this is Resurrection Day. The four things to ponder. Let's just give you a quick review. What did we look at today? Four things to take with. That the resurrection is a story about ordinary people who witnessed an extraordinary event. The second thing we looked at, the, the resurrection of Jesus is a full display of the supernatural power of God. The third thing we looked at is the, the resurrection includes imperatives that we need to follow as well. And the fourth and final one, the resurrection provides a restoration of praise and joy. So today, I want you to remember that you're a part of that story. You've heard this gospel. You've heard this message of Jesus. And you and I are a part of the narrative. We're a part of the ones who are recorded, who have experienced the resurrected Jesus. And do you know that when you accepted Jesus Christ as your own Lord and Savior, or if you haven't and you want to, in a couple minutes, if you want to receive the Lord as your Lord and Savior, it's very easy to do. Amen? But you and I are a part of God's story. And you know the gospel is still being written. It's being written in your life. Yeah, you might not have an easy life. None of us have, have it easy. But aren't you glad you know Jesus? I would rather go through my trials and tribulations with Jesus than without him. He has said, I will never leave you, never forsake you. For the joy of the Lord is our strength. And it's with that that we worship him. And friends, be of good cheer. Let's not be crabby Christians. What would the neighbors think if we come out of church this morning arguing with each other? Well, you got the last donut. Well, here, take it then. It doesn't happen, right? Jesus is Lord. We all ought to be the most exciting people to be around. Even though times are tough sometimes. When I want to complain about the price of gasoline. You know, you go to get gas or you go to get groceries. Have you noticed that there's no pasta in some places? Eggs shortage? Because the avian, avian flu or whatever. It's like, what's next? <laughs> but you know what? When I find myself complaining about the price of gas, I say, thank you, Lord, for this car. The gas might be expensive, but I thank you for the use of this vehicle. This belongs to you, Lord. I will take care of it, and I won't complain. You are my provider. Render your complaints to the Lord. Let go of them and don't complain. Just release them and say, Lord, turn your complaints into praise. Because you and I have more to live for because our Jesus is alive. He's not dead. He's not in some tomb. 
Friday night, we didn't have a funeral service. We had a recognition that Jesus died for us. And today, we're recognizing that Jesus lives for us. We shouldn't complain about anything in this world anymore because Jesus is Lord. Amen? Well, Pastor, you just don't know the circumstances I'm going through right now. You don't know where I work. You, uh, you probably couldn't do the job that I do. I probably couldn't. But I'll tell you something. That job belongs to God, and he gave it to you. Start praising him. There's power and gratitude. And if Jesus can walk to these women with a smile on his face and say, Greetings. He just conquered the grave. Why can't you and I have the joy of the Lord every day? And let's give him thanks. Let's give him thanks. Well, Pastor, I'm tired of this cold weather. I'm tired of the snow. I'm tired of this. Thank God you had the breath of lungs in your lungs and that you're there to praise the Lord. This too shall pass. And the sun will warm up. The birdies will sing louder. And pretty soon, I was telling somebody about this. I know I'm, I need to close. I know. I love Resurrection Sunday. You see these Easter lilies up here? We've got years worth of Easter lilies. I started a tradition. I can't throw any Easter lily away. And so the ones that don't find homes get a new home between two bushes in the front yard. And what's so beautiful is that these start to grow. I was just talking to some of the ladies about this. That when these are all done in here, we plant them. They're bulbs. And you know, for the first year, I think they turn white. I think they're white when they come up. But then they turn this beautiful orange color. After like three years, maybe. And there is, in the front yard is a collection of Easter lilies from past services of long ago. Some of those lilies were given by a saint who went home to be with the Lord. Her name was Virginia. And every year she would have her friend bring her with all kinds of Easter lilies to decorate our church. And I didn't have the heart to throw those away. Her blessing has outlived her. And her blessing still blooms and recognizes the Lordship of Jesus, even though she's home with the Lord now. But friends, life blooms greatly, even in desperate times, even in hard times. You see, we're ordinary people. God didn't remove the ordinariness out of our lives and give us supernatural all the time. Yes, we do have a supernatural God, and I believe in the supernatural power of God to heal, to do miracles. I believe that that is still with us. But God didn't somehow remove all these struggles from us. He's allowed us to go through some of the things we go through. But it's for a reason. To hold on to his hand greater. And to be of good cheer. Because Jesus has overcome the world. Let's pray. Our Father God, we thank you. We thank you. We thank you for the imperatives of the resurrection day. We thank you for the fear not that's the comfort. We thank you for the truth that he is not here. He is risen. We thank you for the invitation. Come and see for yourself. We thank you for the instruction to go and tell others. Lord, we thank you for that. And right now in this moment of sacred prayer, if there's somebody here today who has never asked Jesus into their heart, who has never surrendered their life, then this moment is for you. If the Holy Spirit is prompting you that you need to get right with God before Jesus comes back because you know not the hour and you don't want to be left behind and you don't want to die in your sins, it costs Jesus his life and his blood. It costs him everything for your life and my life, our souls. And so with that, you can say this prayer of invitation with me. Say it in your own heart. Say it through your own will. 
You can't live your faith by somebody else's faith. You need your own faith in Jesus. And it begins by opening your life, opening your heart, by inviting him. And so here is the invitation to Jesus coming into your heart. Dear Jesus, I am a sinner. Say these words with me. Dear Jesus, I am a sinner, and I confess that. I believe that you died on the cross for me. Please forgive me for my sin. I believe that you not only died, but you were dead in the grave for three days, and the Father raised you from the grave. I believe that you have become the risen one. I believe that you are alive. Come into my heart to be my Lord and my Savior. I invite you into my life right now, and I surrender everything to you that you would come and live within me. Write my name in the Lamb's Book of Life. I receive Jesus as Lord and Savior today. Father, thank you for sending Jesus. Thank you for loving this world so much that you gave. And I receive him now as Lord and Savior. And I proclaim him as Lord and Savior in the, the presence of this world and in the presence of the throne. I will declare it. In Jesus' name, amen.